I'm Christina Katapotis. I'm the um, Research Associate and Associate Director of Transformative Learning in the Humanities. Transformative Learning in the Humanities, or TLH, is um, a three-year initiative at CUNY supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm just going to put a link to our website in the chat um, so you can find out more about what we're doing. Um, and if you need permission to um, multi-pin our ASL interpreters for today, please let my colleague Jessica Murray um, or me know and we'll grant you access. Um, so I won't take up too much time. You have our website um, and there are some beautiful bios of our presenters and organizers for today on that website. Um, but briefly, the following will be an interactive panel discussion with four Mellon TLH faculty fellows from this fall, Heather Huggins of Queensborough Community College, Elise Keller of Kingsborough Community College, Susan Phillip of New York City College of Technology, and Tom Slabinger of York College. In the first part of the event, each panelist will share their unique experiences and expertise cultivating bravery in the classroom. During the second part of the event, there will be an opportunity for open dialogue with attendees to engage in discussion during our Q&A session. So without further ado, um, we will start with our first presenter, um, Professor Tom Slabinger um, of York College presenting on the social construction of bravery. Thank you so much, Christina and my esteemed panelists. This is a joy to be here after all our hard work and I look forward to everyone's questions. I teach music at York College. I am an ethnomusicologist. That means I'm an anthropologist who studies music and musicians. And I'm very interested in social construction. These ideas that we share, uh, it can be anything from ideas of citizenship to ideas of money to ideas of music. So I am interested in the social construction of bravery and how we make it together. I think people need to be brave in any creative outlet. I think we need to remember that anyone who walks onto a stage is bearing their soul in some shape or form, some more than others. But we don't talk about bravery enough. I originally was thinking about these ideas of safety. I do a lot of improvisation musically with my students. I've hosted a jam session, I direct the jazz band at York College, and we've always talked about a safe space. I've talked about it for years. But this summer I attended the Jazz Power Institute conference online. It's hosted by a wonderful pianist named Eli Yemen, and it's housed at Lehman College. And one of the speakers this summer was a tap dancer from Virginia. His name's Junius Brickhouse. And we were talking about safety, the need to have a safe place, a place of respect. And he said, looking into the camera, I don't know from safety, what I need is bravery. I need to be able to be brave. And that just went through me. This idea of it's step one to be, bra to be safe, to have a safe space that then allows you to be brave. And that's really changed my thinking. And it's been a joy to share this in this TLH space, these ideas. And I think we've really woven a wonderful thing together around bravery and teaching. So my class that is connected with the fellowship is the jazz band. And at rehearsal a couple of weeks ago, I asked what did it mean to be brave to my students? And I had three very interesting responses. One of our drummers said, to be brave in music is to take chances musically Try new things confidently, give 100% even when you are wrong. You should rather be strong and wrong than weak and right. And it's something I've said a long time. And I, I usually say uh, strong and wrong, not right and polite. And I love that he's, you know, has, has taken this into his, his view on music making. A piano player said, to be brave means being able to take a stand and be able to lead others. Bravery is needed in case others feel nervous or pressure when making music. Being brave is taking the extra step and saying not I can, but I will. And I love this bravery towards the future. And then the shortest one and the most powerful one was a singer. And she said, we stay brave by reminding ourselves the reason for continuing our work. 
And so this idea of bravery interlinked with what we are doing. So I feel like I have to put my money where my mouth is and I would like to be brave for a moment and share some thinking, some deep, deep thinking that I've been doing in TLH and since this summer realization. And I've written a poem. I was in rock bands and <laughs> wrote tunes as a high schooler and in college, and I haven't written anything in 20 years. So today I'm gonna be brave in front of you and, and share this poem entitled Together in Bravery. My bravery is not your bravery, you don't know my fears. You don't know what I'm up against. You haven't seen what I have seen. And you don't know what I know. I have had to fight to be here. I have also had to hide. I earned the right to be brave. I have paid my dues. Why are you not brave? Did you not fight? Did you not run away? Why did you not fight? Why did you also stay? So you stayed. You did not run. Your fears were different. Your challenges had different solutions. How can that be? Is not all fear the same? Yes and no. My fears may be different than yours. My challenges may need different solutions. And I may not have the same strength or willpower that you have, but fear is fear. So fight when you must. Run if you need. Address the challenges as best as you can, but never forget Though our struggles may look different, deep down they look more the same. There are things we do not have that we need, and there are loads we cannot bear. So when you need to be brave, remember you are not alone. People have been brave before, and people will need to be brave again. There is a strength and beauty when we see we are united through our different needs to be brave. Because bravery can be shared and I share mine unconditionally because my bravery is your bravery. Thank you for allowing me to be brave. I look forward to our discussion and time with our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is um, Professor Susan Phillip of New York City College of Technology and her presentation is titled Fostering Bravery. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Susan Phillip and I teach tourism and interdisciplinary courses at New York City College of Technology. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share fostering bravery in the classroom with you today. From the start, when we were talking about exploring bravery in the classroom, the idea consumed me. Uh, as teachers, we often hear about creating a safe learning, uh, comfortable learning environment for our students. But until my colleague Tom proposed the idea, I didn't really think about bravery in the classroom environment. When students are hesitant to to answer a question or participate in the class discussion, I usually use the phrase jump in to encourage them. I realize now that saying jump in is meaningless if you're afraid. So from our initial group conversation, I kept thinking, I kept wondering, what is bravery in the classroom? How do I foster bravery in the classroom? How do I shepherd students into bravery? What do students think about bravery in the classroom? A colleague suggested that I ask them. So I did. I asked my students who are mostly sophomores and seniors, what does bravery in the classroom mean to you? And I received about 40 responses. The overwhelming theme in the responses is that bravery in the classroom is having confidence to ask questions. It is sharing their opinions in class, even if they felt it was unpopular. Students said that bravery in the classroom also meant being able to share their personal experiences. I was very moved by what the students wrote. 
and I will share a few excerpts. Bravery in the classroom means that we make the classroom, we, we take the classroom and make it ours. Courage is a daily practice, one wrote. Another said, bravery in the classroom is also finding the courage to unmute the microphone for introductions, asking questions, and sharing opinions on materials being covered in class. Bravery in the classroom is being able and willing to become an active participant whose purpose is to learn, to grow, and network with others. Uh, another student wrote, I believe everyone is constantly being judged by their peers and to have the guts to share one's experience, there is no better definition of bravery. Bravery in the classroom means to have the courage to speak to your mind, knowledge or experience, despite what your peers might think or say and to publicly speak without fearing, without having the fear of being wrong. Uh, another student wrote, the thought of being embarrassed stops us from learning. That is why to make the first step, we have to be brave and accept it is okay being wrong. And finally, the student wrote, it shines the most when you have an opinion and stick to it without fear that you are wrong because the rest of the classroom agree on another answer. So armed with these responses from students and reflecting on our TLH meeting and using the definition of bravery, courageous behavior or character, I determined that bravery in the classroom was a two-way street of encouragement on my part and courage on the student's part, but that the latter depended on the former. I am now more conscious of bravery in the classroom and want to make it an integral part of my teaching practice. To do so, I must explicitly communicate bravery in the classroom to students. It cannot be something that happens at the end of the semester. I learned from the students' responses that my framework for bravery must include introducing bravery in the classroom early in the semester. So I will ask them the question, what does bravery in the classroom mean to you? And have them write their responses. We will follow with a classroom discussion so that students will have a baseline for bravery in the classroom and an understanding of our participatory roles in it. And I underscore our again, because it depends on the student, but myself shepherding bravery. So with this framework, to use the words of a student, bravery in the classroom will become a daily practice in my teaching. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next presenter, is Professor Elise Keller of Kingsborough Community College and her presentation is titled Bravery as Failure. Hi everyone. Uh, as Christina just noted, my name is Elise Keller and I'm a professor at Kingsborough Community College and I teach courses in communication studies. And my presentation is titled Bravery as Failure. So resistance to failure is inherently linked to education. Felicia Rose Chavez notes this in her book, The Anti-Racist Pedagogy, when she states that she pushes her students to confront their fears of failing when it comes to writing. And Susan D. Bloom notes this in her book on grading when she states that our entire grading system is predicated on the idea that some succeed and others fail. Osa Bavor of the New York Times elaborates that even though most people prefer to process failure internally and quickly move on for fear of causing a scene or seeming unprofessional, taking the time to reflect on and, and communicate about unwanted outcomes can go a long way in creating a more congenial, trusting, and ultimately productive workplace. 
and I would argue a classroom as well. So to be brave in the classroom to me means to redefine what failure means and embrace that failure. I'm not defining failure as something that's a dead end regression or loss of opportunity. Rather, I'm defining failure as good, constructive, and an essential part of learning. As Chavez notes, face fears and failures out loud with each other, train participants and to release fears strangled over their work and exercise authentic voice. I encourage students to do this through simple activities in my class. But one in particular confronts it head on. In my career communication course, students to imagine failure after graduation. What does it mean to you? What does it look like? That's them to bring examples. They free write for 10 minutes, answer the question. I then help groups and share their stories of failure with each other, framed by the following discussion questions. How do or don't we communicate with others about failure? What have you learned from the stories of failure shared by others? What if we expected failure? How could we learn from it? And how might failure be productive? Yet, in order to ask my students to lean into this vulnerable act of sharing failures, I too must model this for them and create the space for them to feel comfortable enough to embrace failure. In some of my most vulnerable moments, I shared with my students the failures I was living through at the time, whether it was academic or work-related rejections or personal failures. I open up the classroom to a conversation that embraces failure as a norm rather than an exception. Another example that encourages failure in the classroom is embracing pedagogical techniques such as ungrading. Research shows that three reliable effects um, there are three reliable effects when students are graded. They tend to think less deeply, they avoid taking risks, and they lose interest in the learning itself. And when students are afraid to take risks, it's typically because they're afraid to fail. Or fail. So to frame the classroom as what I like to call an experimental laboratory, I must also try to engage in ungrading techniques. Some of these techniques may include minimal grading, uh, such as zero scale in which some work is assigned but not collected at all, or using three gradations such as strong, satisfactory, and needs work. I've implemented these ungrading tools in my courses through what I call exploratory thinking pieces. Um, and exploratory thinking pieces are free writing activities that reframe writing as a process as opposed to a product. I also call them ETPs, but exploratory thinking pieces are ungraded and they push students to get over their fear of writing by allowing them a space to lean into writing without the fear of being assessed on grammar and syntax, et cetera. Another technique I use in my classroom is the use of self-assessment. I have students self-assess for major assignments in my course by writing self-reflections about their contributions to certain projects, um, particularly when it comes to group work. And students are, often very honest, which creates an open dialogue about the type of assessment they believe they deserve. So all in all, I seek to create a classroom environment that leans into discomfort, embraces vulnerability, and ultimately reframes bravery as failure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Our next presenter is Professor Heather Huggins of Queensborough Community College. Um, and her presentation is titled Bravery as a Liberatory Practice. Thank you, Christina. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Huggins. And today I wanted to share some of the delicate and emergent qualities of bravery as a liberatory practice. And so I decided to share three stories from my current course, Acting One for Non-Majors class at Queensborough. And they all follow a kind of theme that's inspired by Felicia Rose Chavez's book, The Anti-Racist Writing Workshop. And that theme is release and control. So the first story explores how we're working with open space in class. And earlier this semester, I shared Chavez's exercise, which helps 
articulate the difference between writing and editing and revising in class. And one of the students, Jalen, who's actually always willing to participate, Kate, and she's super respected by her peers for her artistic abilities. She took like a really long pause before speaking. And then she shared that the exercise actually helped her to experience a new quality in her writing practice that she had never felt before. And it helped her to realize that she'd actually been editing herself before she even let herself finish an idea. And that when she read back her work, she was actually very seldom listening to herself. So this generous sharing inspired a class discussion about this idea of release and control. And it actually helped us kind of weave across the forms of our participation. Some students agreed and had a similar experience that Jalen shared with their writing practice. A lot of other students shared that they felt this way when they were attempting to craft performance. And as Chavez shares, Many of us have found ourselves trying to sound like someone else in hopes of being heard, being seen, gaining acceptance, or just getting it right. After that process, a few weeks later, a first semester student shared with the class that he had written something about his grandparents' experience during World War II. This is in relationship to a project that we're doing with the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. And then at the last moment before bringing it into the class, he decided it didn't measure up and he just ripped it to shreds. And this beautiful offering of vulnerability shifted our space again. Another student who's nearing graduation, Daniel immediately jumped in and shared that when he began community college, he also struggled with writing. He shared that when he went to the writing center, he learned the difference between a sentence and a fragment. The other young man was shocked because Daniel shares very confidently now, much of his writing in class, Few others started sharing their stories of process building and writing. And I also reminded the students that I too started at community college and have struggled as a writer and that my career actually emphasizes kinetic expression and collaborative ways of being and that I regularly work on my writing practice. I'm happy to share that the student has recently written down this very important family story and has shared it with me for feedback. And going forward, I'm going to continue to call upon Chavez's guidance and to support students in exploring this experience of release and control across forms of expression. In her book, Radical Friendship, Kate Johnson reminds us that perfectionism and hierarchy of the written word are characteristics of the dominant culture of white supremacy. Second story highlights collaboration. So I sense also this theme of release and control unfolding in the social fabric of our class. Daniel, who I mentioned before and shared his story so bravely as a writer, received support from other students as he learned how to perform. We held space for him to name his fears and frustration with the activities. He was completely against what we were doing. And as he began sharing his draft content, another student, Jasmine, who's actually here today, began offering reflections about his performance choices into the chat. This inspired a wider discussion about the content what was clear to the viewer and where there were opportunities to clarify. Daniel's energy transformed in that moment. He began iterating upon his drafts in front of all of us, inspired by her feedback. Then Jasmine in turn shared a performance video she had created with the class and the class exchanged feedback. So Daniel's willingness to vocalize his discomfort and Jasmine's compassion for Daniel transformed our learning space into more of a collaborative workshop. And it reminded me that our fears can be transformed by the presence and the generosity of others. Also that by including anxieties and tensions when we collaborate, we discover new space within ourselves and within our community. Audre Lorde's writings remind us to welcome tension in our spaces. This has supported me in naming tension when I sense it in the group and inviting students to share their experiences of discomfort. It also supports me in incorporating content around violence and peace. And these delicate refinements to my pedagogy also happen to align with the research of neuroscientists. Francisco Varela actually posits that it's the anxiety about feedback that causes tension in our action. And that when we can let go of this tension, we discover a spontaneous compassion for others emerges. The liberatory practice of engaging in open conflict is another way to disrupt dominant culture. It invites a sharing of power, 
and it illuminates the potential of the group. And I'm also discovering that it's another way to foster collaboration rather than prescribing group work. For the third story, I wanna celebrate full participation to something we talk a lot about at TLH. So after a recent observation, a colleague remarked that he was impressed to see that many students in my class opened their cameras. And this inspired me to think about this fully online course from a bird's eye point of view. And I realized there was a huge gap between the learning that was visible through the cameras and the learning that was visible to me below the surface. For example, one student in our class comes and goes over and over again during the three hours, rarely speaking on the mic and only sharing a greeting or two in the everyone chat. If someone chose to view this with cynicism from the outside, which to be clear, my colleague thankfully did not, they might actually leave this, label the student's behavior a kind of problem simply from the number of times they see me answering the virtual door to let her in. But below the surface, the students in her last semester at QCC and her work schedule changed during the semester after the drop date, no more time to add, which forces her to toggle between class and work in order to graduate. She's taught me to always turn on the transcript because the audio quality is so poor for her any other way. She follows it and then messages me in the chat one-to-one -one throughout the entire class. She's so considerate that she doesn't wanna ask something that she feels like I might've already addressed. But more often than not, I just end up threading her questions back into our conversation and thanking her as I do so. I've also been awestruck by the student's care for the community. On more than one occasion, she's offered unique support to another student in the class. She creates writing and performance assignments of the highest quality, comes by office hours and reaches out by email as needed. I even offered to mentor her if she'd like to present her work as undergraduate research. TLH program has supported me in finding ways that every student can participate in my courses in multiple ways. This is another opportunity to be explicit and brave, and liberatory in our practice. I find that students are also more willing to share what they need, and then I can use their suggestions throughout all of my courses. I'm hopeful that these practices are also supporting retention too. I noticed yesterday that there was only one student absent from this class. I'm extremely grateful to our moderator, Dr. Christina Katapotis, whose writings on flexibility and compassion and pedagogy deeply inform my teaching. And I thank all of you for being here today so we can celebrate our incredible CUNY community. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our faculty fellows and presenter organizers for putting this together. Um, for this beautiful event and creating this space for all of us to think about bravery in the classroom and courage and encouraging and generosity and so much more. Um, I'd like to give everyone a minute to kind of transition into Q&A. If you could find a scrap piece of paper um, and something to write with, it could be an envelope, a bill, um, a note, a napkin, um, something, some material that you have to physically write with and to just write down a question you might have um, or a situation of bravery in the classroom or um, some kind of reflection, just like a draw down an idea um, to just kind of reflect on what we've heard um, before we open it up to everyone for Q&A. So I'm just going to give everyone a moment to write something down. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, if everyone could come back, um, 
If anyone would like to type up their comment or question in the chat, please do so and I will keep an eye on it. Um, and I'll just kind of get the ball rolling um, with a question for our panelists and then please jump in and share um, what, you, what you thought about, what you wrote down, what's on your mind, um, what questions you might have. Um, so my question for our panelists is, what do we do in the first days of class to foster um, the kind of trust and generosity necessary to create a space where students feel that they can be brave? And also like, what do you do or what could we do mid semester to keep that energy alive? Often when there are the most breakdowns, when we feel so much pressure and so much stress, how do you keep that um, sense of um, compassion um, alive and encouragement in the classroom. Shall I jump in? <laughs> yes, please. Um, well, I think uh, I learned from asking the students about bravery. And as I said, that's what I'm going to do you know, you go through your syllabus, you say things, you go through the requirements of the course, right? But I think from the very beginning, as I said, I want to really make that connection and have a baseline for, for, for bravery, but also for some trust for students to believe they can come to me and share a problem and that, you know, I don't think bravery means that we're going to get rid of the safe space, right? We want bravery to be part of that. So if students feel they can come to you and, and trust that you, you do care and you do want to help them, I think that is a way of, of uh, continuing on through the semester. And by mid-semester, that groundwork is already there and you can check in with students. You could say it's tough for all of us. We need a break, you know, that sort of thing to make yourself human. I think that is the part that has to be established at the beginning and continue throughout the semester. I love that, showing our humanity. Breaking the fourth wall. I think in regards to the question about mid-semester, something I try to do with my students is have a mid-semester chat um, and it's required. So every student meets with me for uh, around five minutes and they can bring with them any questions they have for me, any concerns they have about the course or just, you know, general concerns. <laughs> um, and it's also a way for me to connect with students, like you said, in the middle of the semester when burnout can start to happen. Um, and I think the being able to have that sort of um, FaceTime with students for a lot of my students in the past, I think has enabled me to encourage them to keep going in the semester too in the class when they would express to me that they felt like at that point they were starting to struggle or feel the burnout. So. Um, that's one thing that I've done mid-semester. Um, if I may, this idea of breaking down the fourth wall, um, when we used to teach in classrooms, <laughs> and I can't wait to do it again, I would always rearrange the classroom from rows into a big circle. And I know some teachers do this too. It's not a novel idea, but it's one of the things I miss most about teaching in Zoom, even though we all see each other in Zoom if we turn our cameras on. But there's something about being elbow to elbow, as I like to call it, that there is creates this space of togetherness where people can listen um, and and, and talk and the fact that we see each other's and we can see multiple reactions and they can see each other's reactions. So I think that creates a safe space that leads them to bravery. Interestingly enough, 
in the online space, I've done a mid-semester check-in because I teach mostly asynchronously except for the band. And it's been really nice just to have everyone gather in the same temporal moment. I know that's silly, but you know what I mean, that we have a shared time together. And that has been close to creating a, you know, a circle of us uh, um, elbow to elbow. So I think this idea of, of seeing the class as a unit and, and as, a as a bubble in a good way is, is very powerful. And I, I'm going to think, how do I bring this mid-semester check-in? I think, Elise, your ideas are very good talking to students. That's very time consuming, but could be very rewarding, even if it's only a five minute chat. Yeah, I've been doing just regular kind of surveys, actually. I've been organizing my classes modules recently. And so every month or so I check in. And so the most recent one was actually about belonging, how we were feeling about belonging in our class. And also I made sure to ask questions about participation just to see if, if the students also felt what I believed I was observing, that there were many ways to participate and, and that was really helpful to just hear kind of a quick low stakes response to those questions was just very beneficial. And there were also some great suggestions for going forward that we started to incorporate. Um, I think the other thing that's really helped me is just check-ins, you know, just making sure that there's time at the very beginning of a class to, to actually like breathe in and breathe out together and see what's the, what's the feeling of the space and just acknowledging the rhythm and the pace and the difficulty of the semester seems to invite more authentic communication about what's happening. Thank you so much for your responses. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question or share some of your reflection, I'm gonna stop recording um, so that we can just continue and have our own discussion.